Energy Media readers, uh, we've got a real treat for you today because we're going to be interviewing one of my favorite academics, which is Professor Harry Riedenberg from the Haskane School of Business in Calgary. So welcome to the interview, Harry. Thank you. How are you? Just fine, thank you. Now, we did a, a very, very interesting interview back in March or April, uh, and it was around your research uh, about reducing uh, carbon emissions in the oil sands as a means of getting com more competitive in Asian markets over the next five or 10 years. That was fascinating. And the fact that it agreed with the thesis in my book was just a bonus from my point of view. Uh, but now we wanna talk about another area of your research, which is related, and that is innovation in the oil and gas industry. And maybe can you give us a, an overview of, uh, of your research? Sure, happy to do so. And uh, I've been working in this area of research on innovation for, for some time, actually for decades in, in general, but focusing specifically on the oil sands for about the last uh, half dozen to 10 years uh, with some of my, one of my colleagues, particularly a PhD student by the name of uh, Amir Bahman Radnajad, who's now at the State University of New York. Um, the focus of our research is on, uh, on innovation, but innovation in what we refer to as process-based industries. So most of the knowledge that is out there, most of the literature in the, in the scientific literature on innovation is focused on product-based innovation. Uh, the kind of computer industry, uh, IT industry type of thing, you work in the, in the labs, or it could be uh, pharmaceuticals, you work in the lab, you develop something, you get a product, you market it, and you succeed or you fail with that. The uh, oil and gas industry, and also the mining industry, forestry industry, sort of resource industries are different in that they are process industries. They're, the commodity that they produce is indeed just a commodity. It's not a differentiated product that is marketed because of its differentiated qualities. So innovation in process-based industries is generally focused on increasing efficiency, uh, increasing uh, energy return uh, or, or product commodity return for your efforts. Now, Harry, one of the arguments that's been made, and this has been made about the uh, shale basin production down in the U.S. and I guess up in the Montagne and, and Duvernay in Alberta, uh, but it's also been made about the oil sands, and that is that the oil sands lends itself, it's more like a, 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 ma a manufacturing, a factory, than yeah. it is a traditional oil and gas uh, type of operation. And what that means is that once the assets are in place, the facilities are built, then the company can spend its time, as I've heard it called, sweating the assets. It can improve the efficiencies yeah. over time with innovation and improvements. And, and uh, some of this stuff is new digital technology like artificial intelligence and automation and, and so on. So have I, have I got that right? No, that's absolutely right. It is very much considered a manufacturing process. We know what the resource is, what the asset is. There's no exploration aspect to it. Uh, I mean, just the name. Other kinds of oil companies are called E&P companies, exploration and production companies. The oil sands is simply production because there's no exploration involved. There are no big fines or anything involved when you're talking about the oil sands. They've been delineated. We know what they are. And so the effort there goes into increasing the efficiency, increasing, um, the, 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 improving the ways that we actually produce this. So what are some of the, uh, what kinds of innovations are you specifically researching? Um, well, the whole gamut of innovations and there are all kinds of different things that have been done. Now, one of the things I want to go back on a little bit is what drives this partly is costs, uh, because uh, if you have your, your assets sitting there, the more you can innovate to reduce your costs, the better off you are. But part, part of it is also public policy. And there's a general conception that this innovation has only just been happening the last two or three years uh, because of pressures for pipelines and all that sort of thing. But in fact, this has been going on for quite some time, again, partly to reduce costs, but also uh, because of public policy pressures. And I can tell you from my personal experience, and this is uh, partly as a, as a scholar, because I've written a case study on it that's now being published in, in the literature, but I was also a participant, this is a, in a sense a participant observation study. I was a director of a company called Petrobank uh, back in the, uh, in, from the uh, mid, uh, part of the first decade of this century until it eventually did a, a, a merger and acquisition and is now a different company. But we focused on a new technology which promised to uh, produce uh, oil from 
uh, bitumen from the oil sands or from heavy oils using a new technology, a new patented technology called uh, TIE, Totaheel Air Injection, which is an in situ combustion technology, which would reduce the emissions uh, from production by 50%. It also reduced the cost, both the operating cost and the fixed cost. And one of the reasons that that was done, the main reason that was done, and the reason I was asked to join the board of this company, because at the time, this is 2005, 2006, there was increasing perception in the industry that there was going to be new regulations coming into place in Canada as a consequence of the Kyoto Protocol. Canada had been a signatory to the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, it ratified it and then, of course, really did nothing uh, further. But the perception in the industry was that something was going to come down the pike, which was going to mean that we're going to have to do something about emissions. So this initiative very much uh, was, was part of that, thinking about that. Other companies like um, Suncor and Transalta both engaged in uh, emissions trade. So this isn't so much the innovation, technical innovation in the ground, but this is innovative processes, business processes, they engaged in before uh, carbon was even priced. They said, let's get a carbon market going here. And they did various trades with, uh, in one case with Niagara uh, Power Company in New York State, where they paid for the, this, this was a, a power company that had new technology, which reduced their emissions. And Suncor paid them for their emissions credits, even though there wasn't an official market in, in an effort to try to get this going. Transalta did similar things. They also, uh, invested in Africa in, um, in, in methane reduction and cattle ranching. So these are both technical innovations and business uh, model innovations. Now, uh, we should mention for uh, our viewers who may not be as familiar with the oil sands as, as some others, uh, that um, the, uh, either when you're mining the bitumen or when you're injecting steam into the reservoir, which is steam assisted, gravity drainage, or SAG-D, as it's often called. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, you have to create uh, heat, you have to create steam, and you burn natural gas to do that. So the companies are motivated to either reduce or eliminate the, bur the creation of that steam and the burning of the natural gas. That lowers their costs, that lowers their emissions at the same time. So we've got kind of a happy uh, coincidence here where reducing emissions actually reduces costs too. How much of that is a motivation for these companies to innovate? I think that's very much a driver. And, and you correctly said it's those two. It's reducing costs and reducing emissions at the same time. And again, this goes back quite some time. And there are various things. This in situ combustion was exactly to try to improve upon the SAG-D, which is basically the emissions come from producing the steam using natural gas to, to put heat into the ground to warm up the bitumen to get it to, to flow and, 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 and be produced to the surface. Uh, so this technology that I was just mentioning, this high technology in situ combustion, the idea there was to start the combustion underground using the bitumen as the fuel and keeping the carbon underground so that you're not injecting steam into the system. Other technologies that have been used in this regard are the solvents. Syn uh, Synovus was work, doing a lot of work with solvents, uh, electric heating of various sorts uh, in there. Uh, another thing you just re reminded me that has been now gaining some, some traction again, but uh, 10 years or 11 years ago now, uh, I was on the Alberta uh, Nuclear Power Expert Panel. And at the time, the perception was that we didn't have very much natural gas that was before the fracking revolution and we at the same time uh, had the uh, specter of the, the Kyoto Protocol being executed in Canada with, with uh, cl uh, climate regulations or emissions regulations and one of the recommendations of our report which was filed in 2009 was small nuclear reactors uh, to produce the energy, the, the heat to produce the bitumen out of the ground on the assumption that the world would continue to demand oil uh, uh, for some time. Now, that's a very interesting point, Harry, because I, there's a tremendous amount of uh, discussion in international forums and, and in the literature around the electrification of industrial processes using uh, renewable energy, mainly around wind and solar, but some hydro, maybe some nuclear. And the idea is if you can produce really, really cheap uh, clean uh, electricity, then you can electrify things like steel making and, and so on. And it seems that 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 idea might be applicable to the oil sands. 
is there any discussion going around now in the innovation circles in Alberta about maybe down the road using wind and solar to electrify uh, some of or all of uh, oil sands production? Yeah, there is some of that discussion uh, definitely going on. I'm not sure how far it has gotten. There's also still discussion of, of small nuclear reactors as well as something to, to be done. Uh, there's another innovation that's actually a in, very interesting one. When you talk about electrifying um, different kinds of industrial processes, and that is the whole notion of, of hydrogen. And hydrogen, of course, burns cleanly. There are no emissions from the actual use of, of hydrogen, whether you use it in, in, a, in a vehicle or you use it in, a, in an industrial process, but the emissions come from producing the hydrogen, making the hydrogen in the first place, because it's not a, 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 um, an original energy form, it's a produced energy form. And so there's some uh, work going on right now, which came out of the University of Calgary, Dr. Ian Gates at the Schulich uh, School of Engineering, and there's a company by the name of Pro uh, Proton Technologies that is uh, now at the stage of commercializing uh, this technology. And the idea there is to take, uh, whether it's an oil sands or an oil or a natural gas reservoir, and producing out of that reservoir, using the energy in the reservoir itself, the hydrogen, and then with a patented um, uh, a membrane, uh, preventing any other any of the carbon any of the co2 from from being produced to the surface and and so all that's produced to the surface is hydrogen and hydrogen of course is very valuable in industrial processes uh, and in vehicles because anything larger than a personal vehicle personal vehicles battery electric is is great technology and I believe that is where we're going that's what I've I've been seeing the uh, the car companies talking about they're all going that way but when you talk about long distance trucking, uh, ocean shipping, aircraft, and industrial processes uh, to electrify those um, hydrogen is actually a very suitable uh, fuel. And if you can produce it cleanly, it's a huge breakthrough. And it allows you to use the oil and gas reservoirs, of which we have plenty in Western Canada, as a resource uh, to, as a, for the fuel. Now, one of the, I, I, I want to get your view on uh, something that I've been thinking about for a while, and that is non-combustion uses of oil and gas, particularly bitumen, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the road, we, you know, we've got uh, agencies and consultants talking about peak oil demand mid 2020s, maybe to mid 2030s, and then perhaps because of electrification of transportation, a steeper decline curve after 2030, 2035, and that then begs the question: What happens when we begin to see demand destruction for oil? Can we find uh, non-combustion uses for oil. Is that a big conversation in, uh, in Alberta? And uh, what role does your research around innovation, what have you, what have you found out about that? Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's not really part of the conversation. I mean, I'm certainly aware of it. And, and I, I'm constantly reminded by uh, my scientist friends that we're wasting our oil and gas resources on burning them, uh, that they're, they, should, they could be put to much better use and that uh, someday our grandchildren will, uh, will say, why were we so stupid to burn this stuff, which is so highly valuable. But I don't hear a lot of discussion about it today in terms of what kinds of products this might, uh, this might uh, result in. What I hear more about is, uh, in terms of, uh, of oil and gas demand, is when demand peaks, um, we want to be the last uh, one standing. Of course, Alberta is not the only one, or Canada is not the only one saying that. That's very much what the Saudis are saying, that when we're in decline, we want to be the, the very last barrel produced. It's going to be a Saudi one. And in Canada, we say we want it to be a, a Canadian one. Well, I have to, I, I, I've got a dog in this fight because the, the last sentence in my, in my book is that uh, talking about decarbonization and, and environmental performance, uh, I say that when the last drop of heavy crude oil is processed somewhere on this planet, somewhere in the future, it should be an Alberta drop. And so I, I mean, oh, there you go. <laughs> Very now, good. Let's talk about uh, innovation as a culture, because the uh, innovation has been going on for a long time, both in the oil sands and in the conventional uh, uh, oil and gas. And I don't think there are many, even Albertans, who understand just how extensive that ecosystem uh, is. I mean, there are, uh, my understanding is hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars every year spent by these companies, spent by government, 
Uh, and there are uh, organizations like COSIA, the Canadian Oil Sands yep. Innovation Alliance. There are all sorts, there's a big ecosystem out there. Have I got that correct? No, that's absolutely right. And some of the research I've been doing, and you mentioned COSIA, but there's also PTAC, which is the uh, Petroleum Technology, um, I forget the rest of the thing, but it's all their innovation organizations and their uh, conceptually open innovation uh, initiatives. And we tend to think of open innovation, that is shared platforms that everybody uh, puts in and everybody can take away what they want out of there. We tend to think of that. And again, most of the literature, most of the academic literature on open innovation is in IT and pharmaceuticals and industries like that. And in fact, when we submitted our studies to, to for publication, people said, really, the oil, the oil industry is doing this? And it has been doing this for, for 10, 20 years. And so that's very much part of the reality uh, of the oil industry. Um, in certain areas, it's, we found that it's much easier. When you're talking about things like tailings ponds, everybody in the industry can say, look, this is just a, a black eye on all of us when ducks land on a tailing pond and get tarred and, and, and you know, media pick up on it around the world. That hurts all of us, so we all contribute to that. It's a little trickier when you get into the efficiency stuff and the emission stuff. Of course, emissioncy equals efficiency. Efficiency equals lower costs. And so the collaboration on that is a little bit more touchy because if you've got a way to reduce your emissions and reduce your costs, you'd rather keep it to yourself because it is still a very competitive industry. Uh, COSIA has done some, has taken some measures to overcome that. And those who've participated, who participate, who uh, invest in that uh, have agreed to those rules. Um, not, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, it was two years ago, roughly, that the Energy Diversification uh, Advisory Committee reported to the Alberta government, and they talked about petrochemicals and partial upgrading. They didn't talk about, uh, because it wasn't part of their mandate, technology. They didn't talk about growing the, the technology business around energy and exporting some of that technology to other oil and gas producing countries or wherever they might do it. Do you think that there's an opportunity that has been missed up to now? No, absolutely. And I think, you know, the whole talk of diversification is always, let's come up with all kinds of different things here that Alberta should be. But the reality is, in Alberta, we have oil and gas. That's been our backbone for many years. And to me, the new diversified companies or the, the newly diversified economy will come from companies to cut their teeth in this industry and then have gone elsewhere. To me, uh, one of my best examples of that is a company called Blackline Safety in Calgary. It's a company that started doing uh, safety stuff for high tech. It's a high tech company. They were on the Deloitte's uh, top uh, four, I forget what number exactly, uh, high tech companies. Most of them were in California, in, 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 the, in the valley, uh, and they were the only one in Calgary. But they started off producing technology that lone workers could go out, work in the oil field, and, uh, and be safe and with anything that's happening. Uh, and when the downturn happened in Alberta, they started going international. They went into Texas and into Louisiana. Uh, then they start, and they went uh, to the Middle East and to Europe. Then they've diversified from the oil and gas industry into the uh, healthcare industry, another industry where people, where there are lone workers, people are out by themselves and they have a little clip on their belt and, and, and they can be monitored. And they're a very successful public company growing very rapidly and they do everything from product design to manufacturing in Calgary and, and employ a, a highly qualified technical staff. But they are, that to me is a model of the kind of company that we'll see in this diversified uh, Western Canadian economy. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And I, I think that that from a policy point of view, that that is a, an opportunity missed. And I guess we should, we should do a little bit of a shout out to the federal government because the federal government has put, the, put in place uh, its own innovation ecosystem with quite a lot of funding. And one of them, I, as I understand, is based in Calgary. So it's not like the policy framework has completely ignored it, but maybe hasn't right. done as much as it could have or, or should have, because that seemed, I think I agree with you on the, the right. model. So last question, Harry, if you're looking out over the next two, three, four, five years, what are uh, uh, an example or two of really exciting innovations that are coming out of Alberta? Um, well, one I've already mentioned, that's the hydrogen, the clean hydrogen. To me, that is super exciting. And I'll also disclose that I agreed to join their advisory board recently uh, because I think that is one of the things that's most exciting because of the fact that battery uh, technology, battery, um, 
car battery electric uh, cars are going to be the thing for consumer for individual but for shipping and and, and any of the long distance stuff uh, fuel cell hydrogen clean hydrogen fuel cell technology is very exciting and it's also exciting because it would employ what we do the best here and that is use our our natural resources and use them in in the new clean uh, low carbon economy so that's a very exciting thing um, another thing I just might mention in terms of, again, this is a conceptual innovation rather than technical innovation is, and you may have heard of something called Project Reconciliation, and I'll disclose I've also been involved with that. It's, it's an initiative to buy the Trans Mountain Pipeline and expansion uh, for majority uh, First Nations or Indigenous uh, ownership, and then taking the income from that, 20% would go to Indigenous communities directly on it as it's earned. 80% would go into an indigenous sovereign wealth fund, which would invest globally in a diversified portfolio of low carbon or new economy uh, assets around the world, as well as uh, infrastructure projects in or near indigenous uh, um, uh, traditional lands. So to me, that's an innovation, not a technical innovation, but a conceptual innovation where we're actually looking at taking the natural oil wealth beneath indigenous traditional lands and repurposing it to financial wealth in the new low carbon economy. Now, again, as someone with a strategic management economics background, that is a pretty cool innovation. Now, I said that was going to be my last question, and I fibbed this a little bit because one, uh, another one occurred to me while you, while you were talking. So this will be the last question. Okay. Uh, uh, as you well know, and my readers will well know, uh, I take place and I take a, a keen role in the public debate around where energy is going in Alberta and Canada in general. And my impression is that in the public sphere, this idea that we're innovating and that the oil and gas industry uh, recognizes that the low uh, carbon future is, is coming, they're innovating for it, they're investing in it. They're prepared, preparing to be competitive uh, and in the use of new technologies. That is not well recognized publicly. It is privately. It is in the inner, in the industry circles. Have I got that? Have I, have I got a fair take on that? Yeah, I, I think you do. I, I hear that as well. And I find the people that are most frustrated with that are the what I would call the younger people in the industry. There are a lot of very talented, highly educated. I mean, I think Calgary is, has the highest level, general level of education of any city in Canada. And many of them, if not most of them, work in the energy industry, the oil and gas industry, and they're highly qualified technical uh, and, and business people. And they find this very frustrating to be tarred with this brush of being retrograde uh, when in fact they're doing some very cool and innovative things. And I think that is the future. I'm not sure how we, we change that. Um, one of the ways we change that, in my view, is to have the focus on emissions is the issue. Uh, the, the oil and gas industry is not the issue. Alberta is not the issue. It is emissions. And let's focus on that. And that, to me, is, is, is the way we should be thinking about this. But I can, I, I can say that the response to my saying things like that comes very much from those 30-somethings, 40-somethings. Uh, the people of my generation... Uh, are I think at times wanting to go back to an earlier mythical time when everything was great and, and why do we have to deal with all these issues? But I don't hear that from, from my MBA students and from the people that I deal with in, in, the, in the industry that are in their 30s and 40s at the, at the height of their professional careers. I, I'm gonna close with this, Harry, which is that I think the approach to this is uh, everybody needs to read energy media on a regular basis. I will totally agree with you on that, absolutely. Thank, Harry, you. thank you very much for doing this. I look forward to more chats like this in uh, 2020. Happy New Year, and uh, uh, we'll look forward to our next interview. You too. Okay, then. Talk soon. Bye-bye, Markham.